So today we're going to talk about hope, now for the real sermon. That was just the commercial before the movie. Um, we're going to talk about hope. The first candle we lit here traditionally is called the hope candle. Everybody say hope. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, I believe in what I hope for, and I hope in things unseen. The reality of hope, my friends, is dependent on that which hasn't arrived yet. I believe in what I hope for, and I hope in things unseen. You see, in order for us to hope for something, that something can't be here, right? Like if we had the thing that we're hoping for, we wouldn't have to hope for it. There would be nothing to hope for because we already have it. The reality of hope is dependent on something being absent, the absence of something that we need, the absence of something we want, the absence of something that's been promised. There's nothing to hope for if it's been acquired. Does that make sense? And so in order to be in a posture of hope, we have to recognize the void upon which there is something that we need, something that we want, something that's been promised. And I think even as we're starting this, as I start to mention that some of us are thinking about some of the promises we've heard, some of the things that have been spoken over us, some of the things that we're hoping for and longing for. I wish this would come into my life. It might be our sobriety. It might be our financial breakthrough. It might be various justice issues, hoping for the reconciliation in our community or among our people. There are millions of things that we are all waiting for that we're wanting to see. For much of my life, it was my mom's health. We grew up and my mom was so sick. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. We had spent so much of our life just praying and hoping that my mom would just simply survive. Hmm. Many of us are holding on to something, and yet that something hasn't come yet, which means we're in a season of hope. We're hoping for that which hasn't arrived. And in Advent, we we posture ourselves in the same way. You see, in the scriptures, we read about the ancient people who were promised a Messiah. They were promised that that which would redeem the world, that which would save us, would someday come. But he didn't come very quickly. It was a long time, and so they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And in many ways, we are in a similar position. We're waiting for financial breakthrough. We're waiting for health to come into our family. We're waiting for our sobriety. We're waiting and waiting and waiting. But today, I'd like to suggest that oftentimes, the way in which we wait and hope for most things in our life isn't very helpful that we've trained ourselves and culturally we've been trained to wait in ways that actually hurt us rather than help us. You see, too often, I think, and this is going to sound a little countercultural for a minute, but stick with me. I think too often when we're waiting for a promise, we posture our hearts so far into the future that we miss so much of what's going on in our current story. So we've been promised something, right? God is going to redeem your story. God's going to bring your family together. You're going to get healthy again. The Messiah is going to come. We we were holding on to a big promise in our soul and our spirit. And we posture ourselves entirely and exclusively on that promise. Our entire focus, our entire mindset is all on the focus. It's all on the end of the story. It's all on the very last chapter. And we become hyper-focused on everything that's going to happen someday. You know, when my mom was was really sick, there there were times where we didn't know if she'd make it. It wasn't unusual every year or two for them to say, listen, she's not going to survive the week. And there'd be people that would come by and they would say, you know, Tyler, I I know it's so sad that your mom is sick and she's going to die soon. But, but it's okay. We know the end of the story. <laughs> we know she's going to go to heaven. This is no big deal. Like, we know the end of the story. Like, I'm mostly a pacifist, but, like, if there's times where I've wanted to punch somebody in the nose. <laughs> you see, 
to just focus exclusively on the end of the story, completely neglected everything that I was going through in that very moment. It was neither helpful or hopeful when those people would suggest that I skip all the pain, that I skip all the mess, that I skip all the complications right in front of me just to hope for the end of the story. Now, that doesn't mean the end of the story isn't true. That doesn't mean that these end promises aren't valid. It doesn't mean that we don't hold on to them and pray for them and wait for them. But to exclusively focus on them rarely does much for us in the moment. I didn't need people to tell me, oh, your mom's going to go to heaven when she dies. Like, don't be sad. I needed somebody to just give me a hug. You see? I needed somebody to just sit with me and cry with me. I needed somebody to just teach me how to cry. To say, bro, this just sucks. Like, I'm really sorry this is happening. It doesn't make the promise not true at the end. But to neglect that which is in front of us hinders us from all that is right at our feet. You know, in the Old Testament, we read numerous prophecies about the coming Messiah. It's estimated that it was around 1,500 years after Moses first made his prophecy about Jesus that Jesus came. When Zechariah made his promise, this is a little bit more accurate of a number that we, we can say more specifically, it was around 500 years. So Zechariah makes this prophecy and says, okay, Jesus, the redeemer of the world, the redeemer of your life is going to come and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be really good. And then 500 years until that happened. Now, the thing is, is, is when we wait for something like Christmas, like here we are even in this Advent season, and we think, okay, we're waiting for Jesus to come. We're, we're waiting for Christmas. But, you know, like in the back of our mind, there's like a knowing, right? We all have our little like Advent calendars with the chocolates or on our fridge or whatever. The Israelites, they didn't have some Advent calendar in their tent saying, okay, it's going to be 500 years until he comes. He's going to come next. We didn't know. They didn't know when Christmas was going to be. They had no knowing of when the final promise was going to come. And yet most of us, again, we think, okay, we know the end of the story, so we're just going to ignore everything. Imagine living for 500 years, right, numerous generations of your family, not ever considering anything but just the one promise there at the end. Could it be that maybe God had some things for them along the journey? That maybe God had some gifts for them along the way? That there were some interactions with Jesus? In fact, we know this is absolutely the case. You see, we become so focused on the end of the story that we miss every blessing that God has at our fingertips while we wait. That between now and the end of the story, could it be that God has some gifts for us? One image that I use a lot here is, you know, we often, like, if you would imagine we are going on, like, a journey through a forest, and it's really dark, and we have a flashlight, and we start our little journey through the forest of life, and we shine that flashlight so far to the other side of the forest, where the promise is, imagine trying to walk through this forest with your flashlight pointed all the way at the other side, all the way at the end. What's going to happen as you walk through that forest? <laughs> you're going to trip. You're going to fall. You're going to run into a tree. You're probably going to get lost. But when you take that light and you point it right at your feet and you look at that which is right in front of you, not only are you going to get to the promise that's on the other side, but you also will be able to navigate the very journey you're on. Does that make sense? And so could it be that our posture exclusively pointed towards the end of the story is robbing us of that which is at our feet? So the question then you might ask me is, Tyler, how do we wait? How do we go on this journey? What does it really look like? I would suggest that we go searching. We go searching for hope. 
when we were told my mom needed a heart transplant, we didn't have the luxury to just sit and wait for a heart. We actually had to go look for one. You see, heart transplants are a really interesting thing. First of all, you need to be sick enough to need one, but you also have to be healthy enough to get one. <laughs> they, they don't want to give a heart to somebody who's not going to survive very long. But also because there's only so many hearts available, you have to go and find a hospital that would be willing to give a heart and do the procedure with a patient that like, fits their criteria. So we were told, okay, your mom needs a heart. And then we had to go find a hospital that would do it. So we were told, okay, a heart will save her life, right? The heart kind of being a metaphor for the Messiah here. There's an impending heart. Get to have a heart transplant would save things. It would redeem her life. But we didn't have to wait. We had to go searching. We had to go looking. We had to go do interviews. And she'd have to go to every hospital and do a test. And then they'd say, yeah, we're not going to do a transplant for you. And we went all over the world. There's actually one hospital in the entire world that agreed to do a transplant on my mom. But we had to go searching. You know who else went searching when they were given a promise? The Magi. Isn't this interesting? They were told the Messiah had come. They were told the Messiah was near. Did they just sit at their little campsite? They actually left where they were. They went searching. We may have a promise, and we've been waiting for it, and it hasn't come yet. Where is this thing that I've been hoping for since I was a little girl? Where is this thing that I was promised when I was in school? Where is this thing that I've been longing for? Well, maybe we go looking. You see, my friends, waiting isn't just about waiting. It's also about looking. And so this season, while we're in Advent, waiting to, for the symbolism of, of the Messiah to come, we're practicing what it looks like to wait. But what this means is that while we wait, we also look. We look. We look for the Messiah. We look for hope in the midst of our journey. Last, last week or two weeks ago or whatever, there was, there was a shooting at a, at a queer bar here in town, and, um, and it, was, it was just a couple blocks from my house, and um, um, it, was, it was a lot, uh, and, I, and I have, you know, a little bit of influence in that community, and, and so I was asked to go sit um, just a couple of leaders in the LGBT community asked me to just come be with them. And so I actually sat at a barbershop all day and we set up like this like counseling center in the back. And I mean, in, in like two days, I saw like 80 clients. And, um, and then I was, I was there at the vigil and helped set up the vigil for, for, for some of these people. And, and it could, it, it, and it, there, there was a lot of despair. Like it, it sucked. I mean, nothing about that was good. And yet, like when you looked, there was, there was still somehow hope there. Like, like especially in the way people held one another. I mean, I mean how, how could there ever be that? How could there be love in a situation like that? When your friends and your, and your family, your safe community... And yet, everywhere I looked, there, were, there was people overflowing with grace and patience and love. You just got to look for it. You know that, like, Mr. Rogers quote, right? Like, you always look for the helpers. Like, they're friggin' there. They're always there. If we just start looking, we can be overcome with despair. We can be overcome with dread. We can be so discouraged that our promise has never came. But where is the hope? We've got to start looking. Maybe it's been there the whole time. So where do we look? We look everywhere. We look wherever we can to find hope in the middle of this journey. And what we see here is something really beautiful. Let's consider the Christmas narrative. What does Christmas really show us? We see that Jesus was in our physical world. Jesus comes from heaven, from the cosmos. He comes, puts on skin, puts on bones. 
And in this physical world, he points us to the love of the Father that is well beyond that which we see with our eyes. Jesus, was a do- is a, Jesus is a doorway to the divine, showing us the love of a father that is way beyond anything we could have ever seen or made or done here on earth. By his existence in our material world, Jesus points the way to the father that lives in it and beyond it. So the question might be for us today, how am I looking for God in the physical world around me? Where am I looking for doorways pointing to the love of the Father that exists beyond the world in which I live? Again, the Magi show us this really clearly. What did they do? They followed a star. They looked in the physical world and they said, I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm going to look for. I didn't get a map. But they found God speaking to them here on earth. We don't got to go somewhere else to hear from God. We don't got to go to some crazy place to have these connections and find the divine love of the Father. No, the divine love of God speaking to every one of you is sprinkled everywhere in this room, everywhere in your community, and everywhere on this planet, if only we'd be willing to look. Moses does this too. Oh man, this is one of my favorites. Moses in Exodus chapter three, verses one through four. And Moses, let's set the picture here. Moses was in a really crappy spot here in this passage, right? He was like, put in the basket or whatever. He gets adopted into this royal family and then he realizes, man, this like, dude that runs the family is like abusing my people. I can't live with him no more. So he goes and lives in the desert, but he's really poor. So he's got to work for his father-in-law, which is like kind of embarrassing. And he's this shepherd, the lowest job of them all. I think he's waiting for the promise. He didn't know. Like he wasn't at his destiny yet. He wasn't at his big, beautiful moment yet. He was just waiting and waiting and waiting. Walking around the desert, no promise had come for Moses. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. You see, what's it say there? It says, when the Lord saw Moses going to take a look. It was when he went looking. He was curious. He didn't know. He said, man, that bush looks crazy. I don't know what's going on over there. That's not when God spoke yet. It was when he went, he's like, I I wonder if God's over there. I'm going to go look. I'm going to go look. Then God spoke. You know what? That person looks really interesting. I'm going to go talk to them. Huh. Sounds like God might be speaking in them. Oh, man, that person's really different than me. That looks really curious. Their beliefs, their costume, their everything about them is different. I'm going to go look over there. Man, I heard they pray that way, and it looks crazy, but I'm going to go look. Man, I heard the sunset yesterday was good. Maybe I'm going to get up early for it tomorrow. This coffee is really yummy. I wonder just what might God be trying to tell me. You think I'm kidding, but talk to the people who know Christ really well. They find God everywhere. And you know why? Because they're looking. They're looking. It was when Moses looked, then God spoke. So many of us are just waiting. We're not looking. Waiting isn't just about waiting. Waiting is also about looking. What in the physical world around me is pointing to the divine love beyond? And you know why this is so hopeful? 
Because no matter where you are in your journey, no matter where, Christ is near. He is as near as the breath we breathe. Is it not the breath of God that was breathed into the lungs of Adam that made him come alive? That is the same very breath you and I breathe today. God's name is Yahweh. You know what that means? Breath. It means wind. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt like there's not much God around? Has there always been at least a little bit of breath for you to breathe? He is as near as your very next breath. You might be at your lowest point, but are you not breathing? So what is this season of waiting all about? Slowing down, looking. It's about posturing our hearts to the very moment right in front of us. But for many of us, we've spent a long time waiting and hoping. You've been waiting too damn long. It was a long time ago that you lit the candle. This candle today is saying, we're going to hope. We believe that there's a promise. We're going to hope. Then next week comes, and that candle's a little shorter. Next week comes, it's going to be even shorter. In about four weeks, that candle's going to be all the way gone. And I think many of us feel that, do we not? Our finances has just gone lower and lower and lower. We've gotten lonelier and lonelier and lonelier. And this tends to happen with hope. Oftentimes, when we start a hope journey, our hope is strong. It's tall like the first candle. But we think that hope and our strength like coincide that they're equal. But that's not how hope works. You see, hope is dynamic. It, it, it ebbs and flows. It increases and decreases. The longer we wait, oftentimes our despair goes up. We think, I've been waiting this long. My hope must be gone. But you know what happens when this candle hits its lowest point? This is when we light the Christmas candle on Christmas Eve. It's often at our darkest moments when hope seems to have fled our life. When things are at their absolute darkness, that light enters into the story. If it's not for the darkness, what light is necessary to shine? So do not despair. It is when the hope candle is at its lowest, when the light of Christ shows up in our life. The problem is, most of us don't like to pretend that it's as dark as it really is. Most of us go get artificial lights. We go get our flashlights and our lanterns. We ignore the darkness. We pretend that it's not there. Oh, I'm not depressed. I've got my flashlight. I'm not lonely. I'll just watch porn tonight. I'm not sad. I'll go eat another cheeseburger. I'm not that angry. I'll just scream at my kids. We pretend as if there's not a darkness there. And when there isn't a darkness there, there's no need for a candle to be lit. But it's in the moment when we recognize, I think I'm all out of hope, I think I'm all done, and damn it, it's so dark in here. Lord, I need a light. Christmas comes to Bethlehem in a manger, a dark room, a place where nobody expected it. 
at a time nobody expected it, in a place nobody expected it. Who was looking in the manger for the Messiah to show up? Not no one. But if we start looking, there he might very well be. In the place you least expected it, when your hope candle is out at your darkest moment. But that will never happen if we're only focused on the end promise. We have to look at that which is right in front of us. May it be that we don't become so consumed with God's will for our life that we forget about God's will for our day. May it be that we don't become so consumed with God's promise for the end of the story that we miss out on every promise and blessing that is right at our fingertips. It is right here. I know it sucks. I know you want that person to be healed. I know you want to be whole. I know you want things to get better. But what about today? What about right now? There just might be a small Christmas for you today. A small arrival of the divine into your real world. If only we have the courage and curiosity to look. So may it be today that we recognize the darkness for what it really is, and then we go look at that burning bush and saying, it's over there. Yeah. And we just might find the hope of Christ in the world around us. Amen. 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 Yes. Lord, I thank you for this community. Lord, I pray that we would all have the courage and curiosity to look. That in the same way Jesus showed us the way to the Father in our physical world, that we may see the Christ likeness that God has sprinkled all throughout our lives. May we recognize the darkness for what it really is. Lord, I thank you for this community a group of people who are willing to talk about the darkness, who are honest about it. And may that spirit continue deeply in this place. Amen. As I, as I wrap up here, I want you to know that you don't have to walk or look alone. And I wanna make this really clear is that looking and walking alone is really dangerous and that it's wildly important we find helpers and guides to help us walk through the darkness and walk through the wilderness while we wait. Trusted friends, trusted pastors, therapists, spiritual directors, sponsors, we can't do this journey alone. If you need help finding somebody, meet me in the back. I'll connect you. I'd love to meet you if I haven't. So as we go out into the world today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. Be oh so gracious to you and show you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless you and pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.